Hi, my name is um, Professor Gary Collins and the title of my MEM TAP 2020 talk is Penalisation and Shrinkage Methods Do Not Guarantee a Reliable Prediction Model. This is work done with Richard Riley and the following collaborators. So before introducing shrinkage and penalisation, is why are we interested in this issue? Well, standard maximum likelihood estimation um, that we typically use to develop prediction models suffer from small sample bias where the regression coefficients are typically biased towards more extreme effects. And the resulting problem is then we have probabilities that are too extreme. So shrinking methods um, introduce bias in the regression coefficients by shrinking them towards zero, and that reduces the variance in the model predictions. So that means those, those probabilities are pulled away from zero and one towards the mean outcome probability in the data set. And there are two broad approaches for doing shrinkage, and that's post-estimation shrinkage, so applying some uniform shrinkage factor to shrink the predictor effects after they've been estimated using standard maximum likelihood, or we can do shrinkage actually during the estimation, and this is what we, uh, I'm sure you've all seen, ridge regression, the lasso and the elastic net, where a penalty term is subtracted from the, the model log likelihood. So what do we mean by uniform shrinkage? Well, here is for illicit regression model, um, the beta 1x1 plus beta 2x2 is our linear predictor from the prediction model we just developed. We're now going to multiply that by a shrinkage factor s, and then we're going to update the intercept so that we have perfect calibration in the large. So the key thing to estimate now is, is that shrinkage factor s. Two ways of doing this is via bootstrapping from, um, from your internal validation, or you could use the heuristic shrinkage formula by Van Hulleringen and Lassessi, um, which is log likelihood ratio minus p, which is the number of predictors over the likelihood ratio. And we showed in Riley et al. 2019, that can be expressed as one plus p over log one minus the apparent r squared. Let's quickly see uniform shrinkage in, in practice. Well, for a fixed n and, and fixed number of predictor parameters, the graph shows the relationship between the apparent r squared and the required shrinkage factor. Um, as the apparent R squared approaches zero, you need more shrinkage because that approaches zero. Um, we can observe that the small values of the apparent R squared, um, small changes in that will lead to big changes in the shrinkage factor. And that would suggest that there's some kind of uncertainty potentially in how we estimate this, this, this shrinkage factor for smaller values of R of the apparent R squared. So let's see how the apparent R squared impacts on the uncertainty in the estimation of the uniform shrinkage factor. So here are three examples. Examples A and B are predicting systolic blood pressure. Uh, a is low risk patients, B is high risk patients. Uh, the sample sizes are similar, similar number of predictors. Uh, differences in, in the R squared, 0.23 in model A, 0.56 in model B. Model C is predicting log forced expiratory volume, uh, a large sample size again and the R squared is higher than in models A and B. And what we can see is the uncertainty around those shrinkage values decreases as the sample size increases but also as the R squared increases as well. So the required shrinkage increases so it moves away from zero then the uncertainty around that factor increases too. So in situations where we want shrinkage, so the smaller sample sizes, we have much more uncertainty around that shrinkage factor to use. So how does the uncertainty in the estimation of the shrinkage factor impact on predictions from the model? So model A is predicting systolic blood pressure using linear regression, Using the data set of 262 participants, we estimate the shrinkage factor to be 0.94, but the uncertainty around that goes from 0.77 to 1.18. So if we apply those upper and lower bounds as shrinkage factors, then calculate the difference in the predictions, then they generally lie between 7 and 8 millimetres of mercury. Only 2.7% of the cohort had values larger than 10 millimetres of mercury. But what if we reduce the sample size to 50 participants? Well, the shrinkage factor reduces down to 0.78, so we need more, more, more shrinkage. 
but actually the uncertainty also widens considerably to 0.43 to 1.21. So if we follow the same process as we did for model A, we now see um, a wider distribution of, of differences in the predictions. So now we're seeing 20% of the participants had differences in their predictions depending on the, the, the value of the shrinkage factor of, 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 of 10 millimeters mercury or more. So the larger the uncertainty in the, shrink, in, in the shrinkage factor, the larger the uncertainty in the predicted values for the individuals. And thus the concern we have that the model actually might not be that reliable in practice. So let's look at this in a bit more detail um, by carrying out a small simulation study by um, fitting a logistic regression based prediction model. Uh, we're going to simulate 20 predictors, 5 true predictors, 15 noise from multivariate normal. We we'll look at 10 scenarios. Each scenario will be 500 simulations uh, and we'll cover sample sizes from 100 to 1000 in increments of 100. Uh, and, and we'll simulate an outcome proportion of 0.5 in each of these scenarios. We'll look at six methods, so penalised maximum likelihood, penalised methods such as a ridge, elastic net and lasso, and we'll look at the heuristic and bootstrap shrinkage methods. Uh, the parameters for the penalised methods will be chosen by five-fold cross-validation, um, and our code is available on my GitHub page just there. We will then assess the performance of these developed prediction models in a separate validation data set using the same data generator mechanism. We'll submit a large sample size um, and we'll look at performance measures such as the C index, Nagel Kirky R squared, calibration plots, calibration in the large, and the calibration slope. <coughs> um, and we're going to summarize. Um, the simulations by looking at the variability in model performance. So I'm not really interested in what method works best in terms of the, of the higher performance measures, but actually just focus on the variability and also the variability in the tuning parameters. So similarly to the estimation of the shrinkage factor where we saw considerable uncertainty in their estimation, we're now seeing considerable uncertainty in the estimation of the tuning parameter for the the penalised regression approaches too, particularly when the sample size is small. So how does that variability in estimating our shrinkage or tuning parameters impact on performance in a validation data set? Well, we can observe, and it's hardly a surprise, that then leads to substantial variability in our performance estimates um, for small sample sizes. As sample size increases, the variability in the tuning parameters, shrinkage factors decreases, as does our subsequent predictive accuracy measures. So let's focus in on calibration. One of the reasons we do penalization or shrinkage is to improve calibration. So on your top right is, is a, an animated GIF showing the, the lowest calibration plot as a function of sample size for the six various different methods. Um, you know, for small sample sizes, we can see a lot of fanning of, of the calibration curve for, um, for the, for the penalisation methods. Arguably, the bootstrap looks the most stable um, across, across the six methods. Um, we then have a plot of the values of the calibration slope um, as a function of sample size, so we can observe considerable variation for the penalised methods. So on average, they seem to work well. They come out with a a slope of one, which is good, but actually for any one particular data set, the values could range from zero pretty much to, to, to five, and that's a substantial um, range of, of, of performances. And the bootstrap um, shrinkage factor um, appeared to come off quite well. Unsurprisingly, little variation in, 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 in the estimate of the calibration slope. As sample size increases, um, there was little to choose between th the methods. So what can we do to improve uncertainty? Well, we can look at repeat tenfold cross-validation or, or bootstrapping the cross-validation process. Not new ideas, but rarely seen in clinical papers. And this makes a, a, a considerable um, improvement in, in improving the uncertainty um, 
subsequently on, on the estimation of the calibration slope as we can observe in this figure. So to summarise three take home messages, penalisation methods do improve on standard maximum likelihood estimation on average, not a surprise, but they can be quite unreliable in any one particular data set. And that's pretty more pronounced in small sample sizes where there's large um, uncertainty in estimating the shrinkage factors or tuning parameters. Ultimately, um, we should only develop models on data sets that are sufficiently large and we now have guidance now on, on how to do that. Thank you very much for listening. Our GitHub repository for all the code is available there. Any questions, and my uh, co-author Richard Riley will take them now. Thank you.